Hello, everyone. I guess I hope everyone can, can hear and see us. Um, very warm welcome to today's distinguished seminar by Professor Rafaela Ocone of Harriet Watt University. So as always, a quick reminder that this lecture is being recorded and that there'll be plenty of time for questions and a discussion at the end. So please put your questions in the chat as they occur to you. And um, I, I will post them, read them out at the end. So I'm very delighted and honored to introduce Rafaela Ocone, who is a professor of chemical engineering in the School of Engineering and Physical Sciences at Harriet Watt University. And there, Rafaela heads the multi-phase, multi-scale engineering modeling research group. Uh, and cu currently, Rafaela is also the EPSRC established career fellow in particle technology. So Rafaela's main area of research is in the field of modeling complex multi-phase reactive systems with emphasis on the development of responsible technologies in the energy arena. Rafaela obtained her first degree in chemical engineering from Università di Napoli in Italy and her MA and PhD in chemical engineering from Princeton University in the United States. Subsequently, uh, Rafaela has worked in a number of international institutions such as the Università di Napoli, Claude Bernard Université in Lyon in France, Louisiana State University, and Princeton University. And she was the first Caroline Herschel visiting professor in engineering at Ruhr Universität Bochum in Germany, and the recipient of a visiting research fellowship from the Institute for Advanced Studies um, at Università di Bologna in Italy. She is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Institution of Chemical Engineers, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. And in 2007, Raffaella was appointed Cavaliere of the Order of the Star of Italian Solidarity by the President of the Italian Republic. And in the Queen's 2019 New Year's Honours, Raffaella was appointed Officer of the British Empire for Services to Engineering. Rafaela was named one of the top 100 most influential women in the engineering sector in 2019 in the list produced by board appointments firm Inclusive Boards in partnership with the Financial Times. So today, Rafaela will be talking to us about the rheology of granular materials. So very warm welcome, Rafaela. Thank you so, so much for joining us and over to you. Thank you very much for your very kind in, um, invitation and introduction. And uh, I, I, I felt almost a little bit shy with all the things that nice things that you said about me. But um, without any further ado, let me try to see if I can start sharing my screen. And I hope uh, presentation mode. Can you see? Can you all see my screen? Um, probably yes. Um, sorry, I muted myself. Yeah, yeah, That's sorry. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> yeah, so perfect. I, so I hope that you can see it. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much uh, for being here today, and uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, I'm I'm really extremely honored to 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 be here today with you. Of course, I would have preferred to be down in London and to visit the department and see all of you in person, but. Uh, we all know that these are the current circumstances these days. Um, also, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to show you some of our research uh, in the specific area of rheology of granular materials. Uh, although I have uh, been given already a very good introduction, I thought to start with a little bit of academic history, my academic history, and the reason why I want to do this is because, you know, um, when people start to become old like me, um, they start to look at their background. And uh, what I would like to show you is that uh, everything that we do in our career, even when activities look disconnected, indeed, they are really very much linked and all will contribute to what we are scientifically and professionally. Uh, and uh, as I said, I now I start to realize that knowledge uh, cannot be really constrained in silos and everything that we learn from one field, which uh, in some cases looks to be disconnected from other fields, at one point will come all together. 
And this happened to me uh, specifically, as you will see in the area of rheology, which I will not talk about today. Now, as it was said in, my, in the introduction, I got my first degree in chemical engineering from the University of Naples in Italy. And I started to, to study rheology and diffusion in polymers. And I have to confess that at the time, I was extremely convinced that rheology had to do just with polymers. Very, very, uh, very uh, short side view from my, from my side. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed it. rheology. I really enjoyed working in the polymer area, so much so that I decided to do my PhD in that area. So I went to Princeton. And at the time, I wanted to work with um, Bill Showalter, one of the most renowned scientists in polymer science. And uh, things, however, didn't go according to plans. I got to Princeton. Uh, Bill was away on a sabbatical uh, in Paris. And he never came back to, to Princeton. Uh, I don't know if he never came back because he knew that I was I wanted to work with him, not seriously, I think. Uh, he just decided to go to uh, University of Illinois. So I was left the supervisor I wanted to have, and I was looking around. So that was the time as uh, um, when I came across to what Roy Jackson was working on, uh, specifically granular materials. And you can see that this was my second choice. So I, I started to work in the area of granular materials, and even a second choice sometimes can become so important in, in one's life that essentially for the last three decades have spend most of my time working on these granular materials. Um, then uh, after my PhD, I went back to Naples. And uh, that is when I started to think, well, rheology has not really to do just with, uh, with, uh, um, with polymers. And uh, so much so that we even designed and commissioned a rheometer. You can see that it's everything is written in Italian. Uh, this was uh, 92, I suppose, 1992. Uh, and uh, of course, I mean, as you can imagine, the rheometer didn't work at all. We didn't get any good results from that rheometer. It was just a very poor design, never did any good for us. I don't know if at the time the rheometer that we use today, which is the Freeman FT4, was already available. Probably not, but definitely I didn't know of its existence. So we left um, rheology, at least rheological investigation, experiments about rheology, but we continue to do some uh, experiment, uh, some uh, theoretical work about the rheology of granular materials. And then I moved to the UK, uh, went to, to Nottingham, and then I started to realize that we do need some real experiments and we need to validate what we do. So hence, I started to get more and more involved in uh, an industrial kind of work. Uh, we started to do some validation ourselves, and this is what I have continued to do in, uh, and since I, I really came to Heritworth, which is now 21 years ago. So uh, with this introduction, I want to show you in a, in a, with a cartoon, what is the area uh, where my research at the moment is really uh, focused. Uh, you can see that um, there is, a, we, we, we really deal with multi-phase uh, studies. We want to understand what's going on at the particle level. We want to understand what is happening at the large scale. And of course, I mean, we are very much concerned about rheology, which I believe is really uh, um, in between these two activities, one at the micro level and one at the macro level. Um, and this is essentially the area where I'm going to concentrate my talk today. Ultimately, what we want to do, we want to develop a use and spy theory that help master the hydrodynamics of particular media and that can also improve the way we understand and handle industrial processing. Uh, the, the research interest 
and my current projects in which imply ideological studies specifically, so at the center of uh, that diagram, are about wet fluidization, biochar production and utilization, chemical looping, volcanoclastic or debris flow. As you can see, we have uh, really very strong collaborations nationally and internationally. And I believe, uh, and this is another message that I want to give today, that it's extremely important that we do have good collaborations because on our own today, we cannot really achieve anything, I suppose. Um, of course, I mean, uh, this is the area and, uh, and we have really not done so much like we would have liked to do. But I was really uh, feeling not too bad about the fact that sometimes we advance very slowly because in November 2020, uh, I, there was an article in the New York Times uh, saying that no one understands how sound works, which is what we do most of our time. We try to understand how sound works. And it, it, it made me feeling good that actually, probably what we are trying to do is, well, I don't really believe so, but at least the cartoon says that it's even harder than quantum mechanics and general relativity. So still a lot of work to do in this area. And I hope that there are, um, there are students who would like to do more work in this area. Now, uh, one of the problems that we have uh, when uh, uh, we study granular materials is the fact that their flow uh, regime depends on the applications. And this is a first issue, a first problem that we encounter. The cartoon is a courtesy of uh, Paul Mort. At the time when uh, he passed to me this cartoon, he was working for PG, now he's retired. But I thought that this is a very good representation of uh, the intricate behavior of granular materials. As you can see here, uh, at the, the scale and uh, the dimensionless rate uh, create a space where we have uh, a regime which is uh, the quasi-static regime. And we have another regime on the other uh, uh, hand, which is uh, rapid kinetics, continuous granular flow. Uh, in these two regimes, we know relatively well what is going on. We know at the micro level what's happening. Uh, we know at the bulk what is happening. We have a constitutive equation. We know how the, the mesoscale uh, exhibit itself. And probably the same is true also in the other limit. However, in between these two regimes, there is all a series of uh, intricate circumstances that make us really um, understanding very poorly how the transition from the quasi-static to the rapid kinetics flow is going to happen. And this is where we are concentrated our, uh, our studies. And this is what um, some of the results that I'm going to show you today will we'll show you our a pathway towards understanding, essentially answering this question mark here, what's really happening in this area, in this intermediate flow regime. So in order to do that, we started with uh, doing some experiments. And uh, uh, as I preempted a little bit before, uh, we use the Freeman, mainly the Freeman FT4 uh, rheometer, uh, com which comprises of uh, two cells, one to undertake shear um, measurements in the quasi-static regime, and the other one to look at generally loose, aerated sometimes uh, materials. Uh, and uh, like I said, this instrument has the opportunity to aerate the medium. It's a very good automatic device, uh, gives good repeatability of experiments, and it has a very good control of aeration, which is all things that we like very much. However, uh, when we look at the cell where aeration and loose particles are going to be analyzed and studied, 
we, we, we know that this is, uh, the, 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 the impeller is a, is a 48 millimeters helical sort of impeller uh, with a complex design. And this is something which we started to like a little bit less. So it was with this um, using the instrument in this irated uh, mode, we, it was very good for us to have uh, uh, data about comparing powder flow ability. Uh, but the, the geometry, as I said, was a little bit too complex and was too complex for us to be very confident that the stresses that we were uh, measuring were essentially what we thought we were measuring to make it in a bad, to, to say it in a very simple way. So what we decided to do, and I have to thank specifically actually one of my undergraduate students who came from Bochum to work with me. And uh, we were, he, was, he, he was a mechanical engineer student at the time, he graduated by now. Uh, and uh, we start to think what can be a good geometry and what we can do to simplify what we have with this instrument. So we decided to 3D print the virtual quad cell and you will understand soon why we call it virtual quad cell, the uh, CC. And we were inspired, of course, by the head of uh, this, the other cell that we use when uh, we want to make quasi static measurements. Uh, essentially, we need the buffers because otherwise uh, the, 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 the material will slip. It's not going to be sheared. So we definitely are sure that the, the material is sheared. And what we, are, we, 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 we were trying to do is actually in this, set, in this slide here. Now, uh, we take our cell, 3D printed, very cheap, six pounds. To be honest with you, very often I didn't even fill a requisition form. I just gave six pounds to my students and asked them to print it. So uh, 3D printed cell, we merge the cell in the, in, the, uh, in the media, and then we can rotate it. Now, how do we, how can we assure, however, that this cell is going to be more useful than the helicoidal, difficult word for me, um, impeller that comes with uh, the uh, Freeman uh, rheometer? Well, uh, we went back and we look at the, uh, a paper of 2002, uh, which was uh, um, uh, about uh, the quet flow of complex fluids. Uh, and what we uh, uh, discovered is that uh, in this paper, uh, assuming that um, the assuming that the, the, the complex fluid obeys a power law model, a generalized power law model, with some algebraic manipulations, you can get a radius R star, which is an optimal uh, radius, an optimal position here in the gap, within the gap, where essentially these two coefficients, which pre-multiply the torque, T, and the angular velocity, are independent of the flow index N in the constitutive equations. Uh, now you need two uh, indexes and essentially the two indexes are really the stream in which the, the flow lies. In other words, they are material characteristics which represent that specific fluid that you are studying. Uh, graphically, if you plot, uh, for instance, this is just for K um, gamma uh, dot, if you, put, uh, if, you dot, if you plot K gamma dot versus R, you see that all the curves intercept in one point, which is about 20 millimeters. Now, remember these two equations here, because we're going to use this one. And remember these beautiful things which, which is happening at R star. 
So uh, based on, uh, based on uh, what we just learned, uh, we went to um, our mechanical engineering department, which is in the same, in the same school, and we ask our colleagues to 3D print the, the impellers that you see, the cells that you see there. And we, uh, we had uh, um, essentially, well, I reported here four, but we have many more than that. Uh, and then uh, these are some of the three that we, 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 we choose. And we choose uh, um, those based just on the fact that, you know, we wanted to have a good gap between the outer uh, cylinder and our cell. And then uh, we just printed, we just choose these three values. And we calculated, of course, for that three values, we calculated the corresponding R star. How do we validate our, our, um, our instrument? Well, first of all, uh, more than validation, oh, uh, I, um, I, uh, we, we have to do some calibration. And uh, to calibrate it, we did use uh, the glycerol. So we took cells of different heights, uh, different radius, of course, different R star, and then we start to shear glycerol. What we obtain here uh, is, uh, is essentially, um, is essentially uh, the, we, we, we reported, we recorded the torque versus time. And we did that for uh, two different values of the torque. And we also did for different uh, for the different cells. Of course, I mean you can realize that this is something which uh, represents just some selected uh, results of many uh, data and many uh, different combinations of, uh, um, for instance, of angular velocity that we did in our lab. If we uh, forget about uh, very short times where something dodgy can happen, and we can discuss about that. Uh, we take the average where actually we realize that the torque is constant and uh, we time. And then taking the average of that, uh, we use that average to calculate the, the stress and to calculate the stress, we calculate the stress of that specific R star using that formula that I show you. And I said to you, please pay attention to the expression of tau as a function of uh, um, torque. Uh, and uh, this is what we obtain. So uh, within plus minus 10%, we thought that we were very much in agreement with the theory for glycerol and except this uh, um, shear rate, very low shear rates where again something, go, something, um, something happened with the instrument, actually this is a problem of the instrument, the theory for glycerol was well, um, well uh, uh, predicted. Uh, and we concluded that we had calibrated with glycerol the, 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 uh, our instrument. However, uh, as I said, those relationships uh, were really for, uh, for, uh, um, for complex fluids. We wanted to make sure that actually they could be okay also for granular meat. And then now it comes the more intuitive. Uh, interesting, this interesting um, situation. Now, uh, yes, I'm, I don't know if you can also see uh, what I see, but um, I'm moving myself because otherwise you don't see very well the table there. So uh, we took one cell, and these are the characteristics of, uh, of, um, of the outside cell. So this is not really uh, our cell. This is what it's, it's, it's given by uh, the out, 
outer cell comes from uh, Freeman uh, FT4. And uh, for different cells that we call cell one, cell two, cell three, for these different invaders here, we, uh, we calculate what is the angular velocity, which uh, gives us for all the three cells, this interval of um, shear rate. And we did this for three different uh, particle samples, which you can see in this, in this. In, in, in here um, reported. So we have uh, five mil, uh, zero five millimeters and so on. So we have all these different um, uh, particles that we are shared in, in this cell. Now, uh, when uh, you actually uh, see, uh, report now the torque again versus the time, uh, what you will start to see is that also with uh, dry, uh, not aerated granular materials, these particles that I've just uh, uh, told you about, uh, also for them, you see that the torque is constant uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, time. For each cell, the value of the torque is different. This is true for particles, for large particles, and smaller particles, and uh, for a given impulse uh, shear rate. The interesting thing was that when we try to evaluate the stress, and uh, again, using the expression at our star, all the values collapse for the three cells. And this is a, the very first important results that we obtain. The fact that they collapse is in, an indication that yes, the analogy with the quad flow exists. Uh, and yes, these powders that are shared in our rheometer are actually, um, are, are actually obey the, 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 the power law that we, we impose and actually that analogy is really valid for our for our powders. So this is the first important results they obtain. So and uh, and, and of course I mean we took the average there. Of course I mean uh, if you if you really want to have uh, a good uh, rheological characterization, uh, we would need also to um, we would need also to to analyze uh, other things like, for instance, uh, the stress for the different uh, uh, for the different uh, um, uh, particle samples, uh, how the stress depends on the uh, shear rate. So the shear stress, I mean, on the shear rate. Uh, and uh, you can see that lower shear stress values are obtained uh, with the largest particles, uh, while the high values of the shear stress are obtained with the particles DP3, uh, DP3, which are the intermediate particles. The interesting and, and the strange situation is that the, the particles with, with a lower diameter actually lie in between these two, these two groups. And uh, uh, we have uh, probably an explanation about this, which might be explained, we believe, with the difference in the friction coefficients of the, the, the sam samples that we are using. But this is something that we are still investigating. Um, this, of course, but the other thing which is also interesting to see is that this, uh, the stress is, is, is constant for each kind of, for each uh, um, samples and the Coulomb behavior is, is described. Now, another thing that we did, of course, again, to make sure that we have, we have a good understanding of the biological behavior, behavior of our powders, uh, we, we also reported the, 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 the viscosity versus the, 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 the shear uh, rate. Uh, and uh, we see that all the values collapse on this straight line for all the, the samples studied 
the slope is one minus one sorry as expected however if we make comparison with similar particles using a slightly different equipment by the group Nancy in, in France and with the, the, the media being vibrated, we see that there is a difference between the, the, two, the two curves are parallel, and, but the slope and the slope remains the, the same. Um, we speculate again that probably the, the, the difference can be um, linked to the heights of, uh, of the medium, because as we see, the, the heights also has an effect on, 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 the, uh, on, on what we observe rheologically. Uh, next, of course, we wanted to go to the aerated powders because, of course, with the aerated powders, we can really start to look at that intermediate regime that I was talking about. And, of course, I mean, we have some results, So, but these are for uh, um, fluidized beds. We look at some old papers where uh, for fluidized beds it's said that the ideological behavior is such that a, a Bingham fluid um, uh, uh, is, is, is observed at lower uh, shear rate. Uh, we also look at more recent work where a pseudoplastic behavior with, gives a viscosity that decreases with increasing shear rate. However, uh, we really wanted to do something slightly different, precisely. We want to devise a robust instrument. In other words, uh, we want to make sure that the results are reproducible, but also we want to make sure that really the, the flow field that we think it's developing, it does develop. And we want also to make sure that we are in this area here. So we are not in the fluidization regime yet. So we want to understand how we move from quasi-static to, 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 to intermediate flow with the idea of trying to merge these two regimes here. So we, this is why we again thought that our cell can be a very good way to do that. Uh, and we undertook experiments uh, with the same cell that you have seen uh, uh, before, that I have shown you, but now we start to aerate the samples. And of course, I mean, we introduce something else here. We introduce the, the, the velocity of the superficial gas velocity, the velocity of the air, of the aeration air here through the samples. And uh, for, uh, the, uh, for that, we need, of course, to we, we use a dimensionless, like all engineers, dimensionless numbers. We use the, the fluidization index, which gives us an idea of how far we are from the fluidization with UMF, the minimum fluidization velocity, which uh, um, we can, of course, calculate. We know how to calculate the, 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 um, the um, um, minimum fluidization velocity, but we can also uh, experimentally determine with, uh, with uh, Freeman cells. So what we do, we take these values of uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, velocity of the air through the cell, essentially to make sure that we are in good uh, values of, uh, in, in, in the same range of uh, uh, fluidization indexes. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get 2.4 for, for uh, uh, large particles, and this is a problem with um, the amount of air that we can send into our device. Uh, we are, uh, uh, again, like before, making sure that the angular velocity is such that we are in, the, in, 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 an, in this interval of uh, shear rate dates. Uh, some uh, uh, results here uh, of uh, these experiments. Again, we calculated the shear stress. Uh, we uh, uh, reported the shear stress versus the shear rate for different fluidization indexes, 
and uh, uh, as you can see, the shear rate decreases with increasing the air velocity as expected. Uh, the other thing that we we, we, we reported, we reported uh, uh, different, uh, uh, of course, I mean, uh, this is, these are for a different, uh, uh, for different uh, uh, particle size. And uh, I don't know if you have my same problem, but I cannot, uh, I have from my screen, which covers, I mean, uh, this, which covers uh, the, 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 the particle size, but these are the small, I think these are the intermediate and these are the, these are the larger particle size. And uh, for all the fluidization index, the three power, powder, sorry, behave as a Coulomb fluid. Um, next, of course, we want to understand the rheology. We need a constitutive equation. And uh, this is a very uh, famous paper uh, published on nature, uh, which uh, uh, I think all the colleagues working in this area know. Uh, and uh, this is about the so-called uh, uh, me rheology with uh, the symbol me here indicating the friction. Uh, the coefficient of friction. So, so essentially, this theory here uh, says that in a, in a, in a, in a shear flow like this, the uh, you can uh, plot the uh, the friction coefficient as a function of uh, um, of uh, um, um, i. Uh, uh, which is uh, uh, the inertial number. Uh, and uh, you can plot it in this way, and uh, this should be the constitutive equation for the aerated powders. Now, uh, remember that there are some, uh, um, there are some constants here, uh, some parameters from the model, which are reported down here. And this is what we use also in our for these powders, this is what we use in our uh, evaluation. Um, uh, we are really with our, uh, with our uh, um, experiments, the ones that I'm reporting just in this area here. What we do, uh, what we do next then, we uh, try to combine all the experiments that we have done and we report, of course, the the coefficient of uh, uh, the, the, the fluidization index. We report the uh, the uh, the different uh, the di for, for the different particles, as 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 you can see here. Uh, you can uh, see also here we report also the how we obtain that. So in other words, you can see here what are the values of the superficial. Um, of, of the uh, velocity of the gas as well as uh, the, um, the minimum fluidization velocity. And we calculated uh, shear stress, we have uh, the pressure, we have the normalized pressure here, and then now this coefficient of friction we calculated as shear stress over the pressure, and for all these values, for a given particle size, we obtain the same values. Not only the values are the same for each of these different fluidization index, but they are the same, more or less the same. Actually, this is a little bit different, but again, we might have an explanation there. These are very large particles, uh, but they are more or less the same for all the, the three different um, media. And this is, again, a very, a uh, relevant um, issue that we have. Now, what we really want to do, we want to see if we are doing things fine, and we are reporting now all our results in, uh, uh, compare all our results with the theory in that nature paper. And uh, you, I think that the important, I have drawn this line here, because I think that this is extremely uh, relevant for understanding what is really going on. Uh, now, if we have a very low um, inertial number, we have a, 
a good agreement between uh, the measured uh, friction and the uh, for for the particles um, d two uh, d two and d three. So d two and d three here. Okay. Um, and the one, uh, uh, so there is very good agreement between the model and between our results. Uh, for inertial numbers higher than that, uh, the model overestimate what we observe. And it's uh, systematically seen here and systematically seen here. Um, however, we have also to say that this discrepancy is really about a 5%. And of course, I mean, there are other things that we are not considering um, and uh, um, in, in our, in our, in our, uh, in our uh, um, calculations, uh, the, the particle might be slightly different from what we believe. Uh, so this really, uh, and also there is another important point here that, um, all these experimental results are obtained with an estimated value of the pressure, which can be not the real one, because to measure the pressure uh, correctly in that instrument is practically impossible for us. And so this is why we have to take this comparison more like a qualitative comparison, even if, I, like I said, the discrepancy is only 5%. So some, some, some uh, um, conclusions here. Um, um, so we have uh, a validation with no error, and you have seen what we obtain. And we have also some high rated uh, bed where we see that the shear stress decreases with increasing the air velocity. Um, the Coulomb behavior is observed. And, uh, and for uh, this group of particles, the same stress is ob obtained when uh, uh, it, they are aerated with the same fluidization index, while something different happened for the other group of particles. Now, um, um, I think that um, my time is almost coming to an end. I'm not going to give too much um, results about the way wet powders. And this is essentially because next month I'm supposed to give a plenary uh, lecture at CFB 13 uh, in Vancouver, but I'm going to give it, I'm going to be with the thoughts in Vancouver, but giving it from my desk like today. Um, and uh, I'm going to present all our results on wet powders there, but just to give you a little bit of idea of what we are actually doing. Um, I will show you some preliminary, some results that we have obtained on this area here. We are trying to map all the regimes and we use now the other cell. I thought it would be interesting for you to look also what we do when we have, we are in the quasi-static regime. And then again, this is an automatic device uh, and these are the characteristics of the cells. So we are in that field. So essentially what do we do? We put water in our sample. Uh, we uh, mix it, we, we, we make sure that everything is mixed well, uh, we, uh, we then apply the normal stress and we start shearing. We start shearing and uh, we do also some DM, which I'm not going to talk about today, but you, you, we can also look with our DM simulation what's going to help inside this, this app. So, and here again, these are very standard. I don't think I will uh, go in uh, much details through the, the way the experiments are done. If people are interested, they can ask me later on. But essentially what is going to happen here that we do the pre-shear when for, and then for the different pre-shear, we are going to, 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 to make, to, to produce the uh, yield locus and we are going we, we, we draw the Coulomb, uh, Coulomb, the Mohr circle to represent what's going on in our cell. And uh, these are the, these are the, um, these are the, uh, the experiments that we do. We do dry particles with a spherical frictionless. Uh, we vary the 
pre-shear point, the consolidation stress, uh, we, we, do, we, we, we change the water content, which is what we are really interested in understanding. And of course, I mean, we generate these diagrams with the more circle where we can see what is the coefficient of internal friction, the coercive, the coercive strength here, uh, the major principal stresses, and the unconfined yield stresses. Um, if uh, we now um, have, uh, let me do this. If uh, we, we do two different kinds of uh, experiments. The first one is for, uh, uh, is, uh, um, for a different consolidation stresses and uh, for the same water content. So these are the top here is for the same water content. I think it's 0 0.01, 0 0.1, sorry. Um, and you can see that we obtain these three different expressions for the shear stress. Notice that these values stays more or less the same. And this one, especially these two change. We also do other experiments where we change the, the amount of water and uh, we, uh, we do all the experiments with the same pressure, with the same consolidation stress. And we obtain this other relationship here. Uh, notice again that this value here, the, 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 the friction stays constant while what is changed is C, which is actually the coefficient. But yeah. And again, we can uh, do other things for our yield locus. This is just for uh, this kind of particle, one or six micron. And uh, you can see again that we can uh, uh, report the, the friction, the friction versus the 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 the, 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 the shear, and uh, except here where. Uh, we are a very low values of the, uh, of the, the, the compression stress and this area here where, where actually, um, again, we are at the two limits and uh, uh, I'm going to, 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 to discuss with you later on if you are interested in what is really happening here. Uh, you can see that more or less we are around this value here for different values of of uh, um, water content. And the same is happening, and, and something different, sorry, it's happening for, uh, for the cohesive uh, part of the, of the locus here, for the cohesion, uh, which uh, uh, gives us the opportunity, like always doing these areas, to put everything on the diagram where for different particles we, we plot the flowability of our powders uh, using the, the genic classifications. And you can see as you, we expect that when we increase the water content, uh, the, um, uh, and uh, the water content is increasing, you see this is the water content. As you increase the water content, the particles become uh, less uh, flowing and become more cohesive, of course. Which, uh, uh, and again, uh, since we want now to make sure that we understand what all the data do for us all together, a lot of data, we want to organize them. We went back to the literature and we found that there is a paper uh, published not long ago where you can actually um, see that there is a mathematical correlation identified between the unconfined yield strength and the cohesion uh, and, the, uh, and all the different uh, yield loci from the different consolidation stress collapse on one core. And that core is characteristic of the material, but also is, and this number here is characteristic of the instrument. So since we are using the same instrument, we try to see if we are doing our job correctly. And yes, indeed, all our data collapse on the same core and we have exactly the same values because we are using the same instrument in that it's in that um, paper. However, 
we now don't use different materials, but we use the same materials with different, uh, with different water content. And that's extremely important because it means that the water content also dope in a way or give the possibility to the particles to, 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 to be uh, free flowing or not flowing just exactly like uh, cohesive particles, non-cohesive particles are considered on their own. Um, so some conclusions here, uh, the coefficient of internal friction is independent on the water content, the initial consolidation stress, the cohesive strength increases when increase the water content and reach the asymptotic values. Also, we notice that these asymptotic values of the cohesive strength increases with increasing the consolidation stress. And uh, here is just uh, to finish up uh, what you can expect next month in my plenary. Uh, we are uh, looking at the effect of saturations. We are looking at how the stress is going to change when uh, the water uh, is going to, um, more water is input into our, it's put into our media. Uh, we have uh, looking at wet fluidization uh, when uh, we, insert, we use that cell and increase the fluidization index um, for uh, uh, in the fluidization index when particles are wet. Um, also, we are we want to look in the future at particles, different uh, particle shape and different liquid. And here it's uh, what our uh, DM, uh, um, our uh, DM does, and this is dry bed, wet bed, and wet bed with different water content. And you see the bubbles change dramatically also on the macroscopic aspect of what's going on. And the idea would be one day to be able to link this to what we see at the microscopic level. So to finish here, just to tell you again, going back to my area of research, we, do, we I didn't report today, but we have experiments and we have modeling modeling experiments on, uh, on uh, large scale. This is a very big circulating to ice bed in, in China. We work with our colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Science. Uh, we have uh, started to work also with our colleagues at BGS, uh, British Geological Survey, um, and uh, fast flow, pyroclastic flow, avalanches for uh, something which is uh, between, in between uh, quasi-static and uh, fast, uh, sand dunes, of course. And as you see, we have done experiment in this area, but also some, some modeling DM that I didn't show, which, um, which uh, show how the um, how stress chains develop in our media. And then they give a good indication of what's going on at the meso level. And of course, I mean, we have to thank um, uh, Freeman for the nice instrument and also have to thank specifically Tobias, my student, who had this idea of 3D printing our, our cell. And uh, nothing can be done without mathematics. We are also working closely with people in mathematics department, specifically at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, we are trying to start from uh, very, um, from equation at the particle level to do all the average in the right way and to start with uh, collision stress directly looking at the particles. So we hope that we can input our values of uh, the, um, on the wet particles in this operator here. So at this point, I'd like to thank you. This is just a list of the contributors to, to this uh, talk, um, my previous postdocs, some of my current postdocs, my colleagues, my students, uh, undergraduate students now, graduated PhD students, and so on. So thank you very much for uh, your attention and your time. And uh, please feel free to ask me any question you like to ask. Thank you. This is the, the time where I always panic thinking that um, I have been speaking for an hour to myself. <laughs> but I can, see, I can see that I'm not alone. Okay. <laughs> no, Rafaela, thank you so much. I think we've had a very large and I assume a very, very 
captive audience today. Thank you ever so much for your fascinating talk and in so many sort of different aspects as well. I think um, while my colleagues are thinking of questions which they can put in the chat or alternatively, you know, feel free to raise your hand and we can have a you know discussion in words. Can I kick off with some questions which you'll probably find quite silly because I'm not a practitioner in the field, but um, I just generally have you ever had it, done any measurements in any multi phase systems where you really couldn't make sense of the results, I mean you were just puzzled for months and months and months which just they didn't. You know fit with any predictions or anything and it gave you quite a headache. Oh, yes, I mean always to be honest, I mean even these results that now look nice and neat, I think that you know, uh, at the beginning were really extremely, extremely complex to analyze, I, 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 I thought. But um, for me, I think that the most uh, difficult ones were we were trying to do some uh, uh, experiments on uh, non-Newtonian uh, complex fluids and uh, uh, things that you don't realize that for instance, the morphology is changing, and then you cannot explain why you observe something. And uh, this is another message and something that I, we would like to do now, I think, to combine what is going on at the bulk level with what is going on at the micro level. If you can do simultaneously the two measurements, we help to uh, understand what's going on. I always remember that, you know, when I started to study non-Newtonian fluids, which are really, I mean, extremely complex, I suppose, uh, some of them can be extremely complex. I remember that one of my teachers used to say, well, the only thing that we know is that they are non-Newtonian. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think that, you know, yes, but particles, are, I think, have are very counterintuitive and uh, and sometimes we get results that we don't really know where they come from so particles probably are also very complicated for me yeah and do you have any issues with contamination ever especially in your aerated experiments where you sort of expose it to air and suddenly the whole fluidization behavior changes and your results go uh, so we, 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 we do but and one of our another problem that we have uh, and this is why we are trying now to get rid of uh, water uh, we are we don't know how well we control the amount of water uh, I mean okay in a, uh, I think that you know uh, evaporation can be a problem mm -hmm. uh, well in Scotland probably less than in Naples <laughs> um, so but uh, that's another thing in fact what we are trying to do now we have uh, just we bought just before uh, the lockdown a, a condition cell where we can actually make sure that you know we, we control how much water we have there and we are also doing experiments with other uh, liquids we do believe that the other li other liquids viscous liquids very viscous ones can affect also what we have so contamination yes but i think that um the, during the experiments, probably it's not so much contaminations, it's more about uh, not be sure water content, I suppose. Mm -hmm. okay. And also, I mean, some attrition that is going on, particles that can change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, I have one question from Jeffrey Maitland. Yes, I, hi, Jeff. Sorry. Right, so I'm unmuting. Jeff, are you able just to ask? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, very well. Hi, Jeff. How are you? I'm fine, Raphael. Great to see you online. Um, yes. uh, thanks very much for your lovely talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I just got a couple of brief questions. Mm. One is, I was interested with the uh, the dry systems uh, before you aerated them that uh, the mono dispersion larger particles had a lower viscosity both at low shear rates and the effective viscosity at high shear rates than the polydispersed systems which I, I would expect because I'd expect polydispersity to increase the packing fraction of the particles whereas when you aerated them uh, and uh, partially fluidized them with air they inverted that the viscosity for the larger monodispersed system um, that the, the the viscosity was higher for that and it went down as the polydispersity increased. I wondered if you had an explanation for that, whether I made the observation correctly indeed. Uh, well, uh, there are two points here. 
the first point um, that we want to really to check carefully, uh, we have, uh, you have to be a little bit aware of the samples that we are using. And I'll tell you why. Uh, for uh, the ones that you have a sort of polydispersity, uh, those are uh, sieved in our lab. The other one, the five millimeters, are not sieved, are bought as five millimeters. So uh, I'm not saying that this is an explanation, but the first, um, the first caution that I will use is that we discovered soon that when we buy particles, it depends how much we spend. And uh, if you want to have really perfectly spherical or monosized particles and so on, you have to spend quite a lot. So um, there is, first of all, a little bit of inconsistency there uh, that um, you, 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 you should be aware of. Mm -hmm. So this is already something. So if I, I go back, can I go back to essentially to the, the where, where is the, the, the slide? Do you remember which slides was that? It was about um, a third of the way through. Keep going back. So that we can, I, it's easier for me to speak on the, on the values. Um, hang, yeah, now, um, so go to slide 21. 21, you said. This so, one? So that one, yes, where the, um, oh. that's for the dry system, isn't it? And uh, the uh, 0.5 millimeter, uh, oh. These are for the dry system, and these are for uh, the aerated ones, mm. okay? So uh, the five millimeters are those ones, right? So this is no aeration. Yeah. Uh, this is with uh, low aeration, with slightly higher aeration. Right. And the same here, these are for uh, the, the particles that I said we sieved and uh, uh, no aeration, low, higher, higher, higher. So the aeration is increasing in this way. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I think that that makes sense because you are going, the more you are rated, the more you go through the fluidization regime, fluid-like system. So the fact that they go down in this way here, uh, I think that they make sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that they go down with degree of fluidization. It's just the, the, the relative um, between the relative, with the different particle sizes, yeah. Yes, so from here to here, so what you, um, okay, so I, I, I see what you mean now, uh, because you are saying that the, stress, the shear stress for, uh, the, um, for the smaller particles is higher than the one you have for the larger particles, right? But I think this is this is this is a uh, this is a problem probably uh, with the friction. Yeah. So I'm interpreting that, that I'm interpreting that as the fact that if they're more polydispersed, then the packing fraction is higher, and therefore you'd expect the shear stress to be higher. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I I don't think that it's only that to be honest. Okay. Yeah, right. I think that there are other uh, factors there, and I was more looking at the, sh at the, the, I was looking more at the friction, to be honest. Yeah. But that's a nice thing that probably I'm just trying to think if we have any data or if we can do some uh, quick check of what we should expect there, and or even better to to do, but, but, but you know, I don't think, I don't think that it has to do very much with this because uh, 
well let me see uh, for uh, yeah here it's up uh, these are the smallest one uh yeah you're right i think that this is the this is the problem because look here we have for the in the smallest one we have something between 250 and 300 mm. for the intermediate ones well we have a probably something higher but then it doesn't go exactly in the same direction and down again yeah so it's not not straightforward yeah it's not straightforward, but I think that probably this is something that, um, I think that this is something that we observed, uh, we observed uh, also with the I-rated powder, with the no I-rated powders, I mean, because uh, this is what I was implying before when I said, even with the non-irated powder, we have exactly uh, these things here because the, the, the red is the intermediate. Intermediate one, yeah. This is the larger and you would have expected that the, um, the smallest one would be higher than that. Yeah, I think okay. without knowing the, the ex extent, you know, the, the extent of the polydispersal, I think, the yeah, um, isn't it? Yeah. I think that variation could be explained with, by the difference in the fact in the friction coefficients of these mm -hmm. samples. Mm -hmm. So we believe that that's the explanation. Um, now, uh, it would be interesting, actually this is a very good point, I didn't think about that before, but it would be interesting to look at the uh, friction coefficient in the fluid, I'd say, in the, in the I-rated samples, because over there we have a better way, at least we have a theory, which can probably help slightly to understand what's going on there because this is systematical. So it has to be linked to the powders, but it looks like uh, the air doesn't overcome that effect, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Mm, very, yeah. I, 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 should, I should look into this, but, but I, I think the, the, the explanation that we, we, we thought when we look at this data was that uh, the friction uh, coefficient of this powder stud is different. And that was affecting what we, we saw. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, there's, a, there's a question here, Rafaela, in the chat uh, about how reproducible the wet shear experiments are in terms of raw data and mathematical derived parameters. So coefficient of in, uh, internal friction and cohesive strength. Uh, how we, in the, uh, sorry, can you... How reproducible the wet shear ah. experiments are in terms of raw data and mathematical, um, uh, well, uh, the derived parameters, yeah. Uh, well, all the experiments that you have seen have been uh, repeated. Mm. So yeah. They are all, uh, all are repeated, uh, sometimes uh, three times. In the worst scenario, they are two times, but they are all repeated. So, mm -hmm. so, so they are reproducible. I, I, I think, we think. Uh, some, like I said, I mean, you know, it might be, especially with the wet samples, there might be something which is going to be slightly different, which we don't have control of, which would be at, the, at this point with, uh, with the water. But otherwise, I think that they, they are, they can be reproduced and we are happy about that. Okay. Okay, thank you. And and also, do you do you have any plans to investigate non-spherical particle rheology? Not not at the moment. No, uh, we don't have. Uh, uh, we want to do that, but we have not data at the moment, and we are not. We we have, we have not we've not done that. No. Okay, and there's a question from my colleague, I think it's Daryl Williams, who has posted the question twice, so I think that uh, he would very much like to know the answer. So, did you notice for the dry flow of glass beads any effects of humidity or electrostatic charging factors? Uh, yes. 
Uh, yes. Um, and uh, um, yeah, uh, this is, uh, uh, there you know that this is a very uh, relevant, uh, relevant uh, issue there. Um, now for the electrostatic, you can do different uh, things. There, there will be some, there might be some electrostatic uh, charging and some, some effects. Uh, you can uh, work on the air to make sure that you know uh, you you make sure that you you uh, you unify you mean anyway you you make sure that the the air is such that it doesn't give the ch try to lower the electrostatic charge but yes there, there are some electrostatic charging factors there which which we are, we are not controlled at the moment there is a colleague of mine who is uh, uh, working at the, at the moment on electrostatic charging and uh, he was planning again to do experiments but um, um, but everything is stopped and <laughs> I don't I we don't have anything about that but yes that's an issue yeah. thank you very much Daryl if you want to follow up you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you if you want to have a discussion but I'll read now a question from Omar who uh, has yeah. heard, but uh, so in terms of modeling are there opportunities to use machine learning to learn forms of kernels or operators that can be embedded into a continuum scale description of wet granular flows uh, yes uh, I, I I think that's a great question and I think that I always had in mind that uh, for uh, many issues with particles, even for uh, um, for uh, poly dispersed particles, if you can have a continuum description like we do, for instance, with lambda kinetics, where you just have a different kernel which describes um, the different uh, sizes. You can have breakage, you can have, uh, you can have agglomerations and the kernel can take care of uh, everything which is happening. If you, have, uh, if you have integrals and you have a continuum approach, it's much easier than to have uh, summations, I suppose. Uh, we always stopped before because uh, because, of course, I mean, when you do these things numerically, not with, uh, um, with uh, um, machine learning, uh, you are stuck. But, of course, I mean, this is uh, something that we think can be done. And we are trying now with something which we have, uh, which is not linked to, to particles, but we have very well established previously in lumping kinetics and see if machine learning works. It's a collaboration with my colleague, Jing Tsuan, um, University of Loughborough, where we are supervising a student, where we are trying to see if we can uh, use machine learning for uh, continuum lumping. If that works, I think that we can uh, do also something in terms of size, in terms of uh, um, uh, description of wet granular flow just go continuously from from one end to the other end. So yes, um, it would be a nice work to do. Fascinating. I think that's all the questions in the chat. Could I squeeze in one very, really basic technical question because I, really, I thought of it. So um, it you showed your impellers right in the beginning, your 3D printed ones. I mean, uh, uh, the ones of different different size, different length, and they all had six paddles. Is that the right word? Six paddles? Uh, we call it baffles, but I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, don't ask, don't ask me. I mean, you know, I English. I mean, um, <laughs> yes. Uh, I suppose. That. I suppose uh, so presumably it's six to ensure the balance of forces for even stirring. But but then on slide um, 29, you showed some really like enormous paddles, enormous imp impellers with lots of these. Um, so I think that the how do you decide what to this use? One, the, the one on the size 29. You had it in the beat. Yeah, oh, yeah. This is the this one, isn't it? Yeah, how do you uh, decide? The, this, this is the one this is the one which uh, which uh, uh, comes with uh, um, the the Freeman this is from Freeman uh, FT4 now uh, it is a balance as you said in terms of what you want, the number of blades but to be honest for the analysis that we are doing it's not so important what is really important uh, and this is why I found that that paper where they 
the mathematical derivation of R star is done, it's absolutely fascinating because uh, you can have very complex geome geometry, but you will uh, be able with the different geometries doing some uh, algebraic uh, derivations to reach a point where actually you reproduce the analogy with quad flow. Mm -hmm. So we didn't worry too much about the number of uh, puddles or, or baffles, whatever you want to call them, provided we had the medium shear. Because if you have uh, completely uh, with no puddles or no, um, you don't shear it. It, it, it will adjust the slip and then you don't shear the medium. So this is just to shear, to make sure that we shear the medium. Uh, and that was a much easier geometry for us to calculate that R star. I'm sure that you can calculate R star also with the original impeller, mm -hmm. but that's geometrically complicated. You have to have the perfect geometrical expression for that mm -hmm. impeller. And you have to set follow all the procedure to calculate the equivalent R star. And this is where we were uh, stuck because we didn't know exactly the equation for the geometry. Uh, we were not sure how to convert precisely and uh, well the torque to the shear stress, but more importantly, whether we were creating, and there was at least in some place that the analogy with quad flow was obtained because one of the problems I always had, and you ask me what the problems are, the problems that I always had, am I measuring what I think I'm measuring? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we start to see that systematically everything collapsed to one, uh, one um, value of the shear stress for different torques, provided that, that shear stress is calculated at R star, we thought the analogy must should be okay. I never say must in, in the science, but should be okay. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think that that's, that's why we went for that simplified geometry, mm -hmm. which we could calculate, our, for which we could calculate our star much more easy. There were other things that are not discussed today. Um, one of our reviewers, when we present the paper, also said, how much is the, the, the gap from the base of the outer uh, cylinder and the cell going to affect what we measure? Because that can affect as well. Ah, uh, because it pulls solution up, right, like this. And in fact, I mean, and that, uh, that, that's the kind of uh, uh, comments that when the review does very interesting comments like that, you really take them on board. And we did more experiments and we put more experiments to show that, you know, at least in the range that we were doing the, thing, the, 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 the evaluations, we, uh, the gap was not uh, influencing what we were doing. <laughs> but, you know, uh, again, there are so many other things and details that we need to be um, taken into consideration that, mm -hmm. like I said, there is still a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah, there always is. <laughs> okay, okay, Raphael, I think I'm, I'm, I'm trespassing on your time now and I uh, hope you have a, a, some time to go grab a cup of tea before, you, before chatting with Omar, but I'd like to thank you on behalf of the whole department for giving such a wonderful talk, for joining us today, for answering all the questions, the discussions, everything. Thank you ever so much. It was wonderful to meet you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for being here in front of a computer and <laughs> bearing with me. Thank you very much.